Buenos días, yo soy Lice Casper, también del equipo 8.8. Tengo el agrado de darle la bienvenida a nuestro primer keynote hoy día, Dr. David Mossington. I'll switch to English so that David can understand us. Welcome, David. Um, Dr. David Mossington serves as the Executive Assistant Director of the EAD for the Infrastructure Security Division at the Department of Homeland Securities, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency called CISA as of February 2021. As EAD, he helps lead CISA's efforts to secure the nation's critical infrastructure in coordination with government and the private sector. His priorities for ISD include vulnerability and risk assessments, securing soft targets and crowded bases, training and exercises, and securing high-risk chemical facilities. David, welcome to 8.day Fuerzas Armadas in Spanish. We're so happy to have you here with us today. And I'll turn over the word to you. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa, and thanks for the invitation to speak. Um, I'm going to try and keep this short so there'll be some time for questions. Um, Look, I don't assume anyone knows what CISA does, so I'm going to be describing that and then describing some concerns and risks that we think about a lot. Um, so first, um, I'm David Mussington, long title for a very specific job. CISA is split into more than two big parts, but the two largest parts are the cybersecurity side of the house and the infrastructure security side. I, I lead the critical infrastructure security part of CISA which is physical and cyber security and risk management. Um, it's three years old. Um, and so three years ago, the US Congress decided to create a new agency that was solely concerned with critical infrastructure security, cyber security, cyber risks and outreach to industry. You did that for a few reasons. Um, after all, the critical infrastructure role existed much longer than the last three years. It's been in existence for a lot about 20 years. Um, the real concern that we weren't making progress fast enough. We weren't actually protecting critical infrastructure from escalating risk from all sorts of different actors, from nation states to, to criminals, to other people in between, to proxies who work for nation states and criminals. So the idea was new agency, new mission, um, new problem set, and a new set of solutions. Um, so. We're, we're fashioned as the nation's cyber and infrastructure defense agency. You know, that's different than protection alone. Defense has a connotation of proactive action as well as, um, as, well as outreach. And that's really what we're about. We're a civilian agency. We're part of the Department of Homeland Security, not part of the Defense Department. We do, however, try and think systematically about what it takes to defend critical infrastructures at scale, not simply one critical company or one critical bridge or tunnel, but the country's um, bridges and tunnels and critical um, industrial and economic resources that keep the country functioning, keep the government functioning. So that's why we're the nation's cyber and infrastructure defense agency and we're part of the Department of Homeland Security. We're central. We, have, we do, however, lack almost, well, we're completely lacking in authority. So how do we execute our mission? We execute it through a set of public-private partnerships. We're not supposed to be a traditional government agency. There's a lot of criticism in the United States about what government agencies constitute, uh, whether we're efficient or not. So we're designed to be a hybrid public-private institution. In fact, the agency is built on our foundation of collaboration, cooperation, information sharing and action across public and private sectors and with international partners. That's the heart of our goal of raising and enhancing collective cyber defense. So the two main roles, just to be specific, are we serve as the operational lead for federal government cybersecurity, and we serve as the national coordinator for critical infrastructures. The US has 16 critical infrastructures. I don't know how many uh, infra critical infrastructures Chile has. Most countries have less than 16. In a few, few months, we may have less than 16. Um, and I'll get to that in a few minutes. But our mission is to, to lead the national effort coordinating between infrastructure owner operators and government entities at the state and local level that collectively oversee critical infrastructure risk management. 
So we're tasked with some of the biggest challenges facing both government and industry, from securing large federal networks, or, uh, federal civilian agencies, I should add, um, and doing cyber incident response assistance to private organizations that need to secure critical industrial control systems. Uh, but you know, to gen more generally, so that it was created and designed to work across the public private sectors to help secure the nation's critical infrastructure. Um, that includes everything from um, cyber threats that threaten dams to all hazards, natural disaster, climate change related infrastructure disruptions that threaten the delivery of critical services. Now, as we work to address these threats and hazards, CISA has adopted a holistic approach Again, it's all hazards, all risks, not simply cyber risks, even though the cyber risks are the, the center of uh, gravity for my comments today. We prioritize systemic risks to critical infrastructure. That is, those risks that scale from a single event to a broad sectoral or national impact. So that's what we mean by critical systems, and that's what we mean by securing critical functions. So some of those critical systems are, you know, waste and wa waste, water, waste uh, water and water treatment systems, transportation systems, energy systems, uh, and telecommunication systems, among others. Now, as we learned from the recent Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack that you may have read about and seen in the media, successful attack on a critical system or function can block vital services to an entire segment of society, even if the attack itself is not particularly novel. After all, ransomware is fairly well known. Effective cybersecurity cyber requires that we pay attention to attacks that give asymmetric em empowerment or power to the attacker. That's what ransomware does by denying access to critical systems at Colonial. Oil and energy supplies on the East Coast of the United States were disrupted. Prices increased, gas lines increased, and actual price inflation increased for a short period of time. Now, were those attacks launched from the United States? Maybe, don't know. Could they have been launched from anywhere else? Definitely, because of internet connectivity. That's why, um, from a whole set of different vectors, critical infrastructure, cybersecurity is one of those national concerns that gets federal attention in the US. But if the last year has taught us anything, because Colonial wasn't alone, it's that simple um, attacks can have complex consequences. And that's, that simplicity to complexity uh, dynamic is another focus of CISA. Now, to, uh, to attack those particular kinds of problems, CISA offers fairly mundane advice, but with a complex kicker at the end. So I'll go through what the mundane advice is, then I'll give you the complex uh, underlying point. First, we encourage international partners in our critical infrastructure sectors to adopt more stringent cybersecurity practices for protecting and maintaining their cyber quest, cyber operations. That means that we don't assume that um, our partners are better or worse than us in cyber hygiene. Um, we certainly don't claim to be the best. Um, no one who looks at our history of cyber um, disruptions and ransomware issues could consider us better than other people. But we do have some experience in terms of uh, cyber hygiene and, and best practices for risk management. We try and share that and we try and learn from, from the experiences of others who have similar uh, history with operating critical infrastructure and a similar journey of confronting risks that, that go from the simple to the complex. So using basic cyber hygiene habits, like multi-factor authentication, up-to-date antivirus software, strong passwords, network segmentation, other best practices, is where we start. It means being vigilant against phishing attempts, things that this audience knows well, but things that are often not done well in industry or in government. So we focus there first to try and get the foundations correct before we build to more sophisticated mitigation and risk management principles. Second, we look at supply chains, vendor supply chains, vendor relationships, when we try and ask um, what best practices or principles guide what one needs to know about suppliers. In fact, we've actually translated many of these cyber hygiene tips into Spanish on our website, CISA.gov. So we're sharing outwardly, proactively with partners, and we, we seek in return uh, for partners to share with us. After all, we can all learn from each other's risk experience, even if things aren't exactly the same. Attackers who go at one kind of target in one country often use the same techniques somewhere else. So in sharing these baseline techniques, 
It's about, we think, raising the security baseline of products as they're integrated into complex systems, as that's done in one place, that shared defensive and pro protective experience can add to the um, safety and security of others, make the internet a somewhat safer place, not a safe place, but a, safe, but a safer place. Next thing we emphasize is teamwork, teamwork and information sharing. Because we emphasize um, collaboration and partnership, we have to emphasize that on the basis of a common information frame, common information base. What we know about threat needs to be parallel. What we know about risk needs to be parallel. What we know about mitigations and best practices needs to be parallel. Each of those things are shared in different international and overlapping fora from industry uh, conferences to direct bilateral relationships like the one uh, CISA has with parts of uh, MOI in Chile. So the notion is shared situational awareness on risk, shared risk experience, shared awareness of the techniques used by attackers, and including criminals and nation states, that leads to shared ability to understand trends in critical infrastructure risks, and shared ability to hopefully integrate collective defense. Collective cyber defense of critical infrastructure is something that TIS is paying a lot of attention to in a new international strategy that I'll mention shortly, but it also means leveraging the strengths and accesses of other people. Uh, in that the US can't be everywhere, CISA certainly can't be everywhere. We're, we're small, approximately 3,000 people in our, in our agency. So we leverage, by definition, the strengths of the private sector and of our citizens and our international partners. The teamwork is central to achieving secure and resilient infrastructure, uh, cybersecurity, because you need to have, be persistently good, not just good around specific incidents. So once you have that baseline of shared threat security information and mitigation advice, the question is what's next? Uh, what's next is the ability to model based on data, the prospective behavior of adversaries who seek to exploit critical infrastructure. That means applying machine learning, artificial intelligence, and sim in simulations of critical infrastructure, try and anticipate the TTPs, the tactics, techniques, and procedures of adversaries so that you can get a little bit ahead of the game. After all, defense is at a disadvantage in cyberspace. What that means is that we have to be smarter and faster and leaner. That means proactive exploration of vulnerabilities, vulnerability management and exploitation pathways, trying to anticipate where bad guys will go if cyber defenses are in some way weakened or not present at all. Next point, cybersecurity is viewed says, as a shared responsibility. And I wanna stress that, shared responsibility. That means that we each govern our parts of cyberspace through our different national laws and traditions and culture. Because of the links within the internet and within critical infrastructure and networks that are connected to the internet, vulnerability in one place can be exploited from another jurisdiction or another country. That means that securing critical infrastructure, the collective responsibility, and has to be collective in order to, um, to create the potential for sustained success. There's no way that you can achieve persistently better defenses without collaborating with neighbors who have the ability to compel, in some cases, better cybersecurity practices or their critical infrastructure partners. And so again, back to teamwork, teamwork between jurisdictions and governments, teamwork between jurisdictions and companies, teamwork between companies and their customers, each leveraging cyber hygiene and enhanced situational awareness to make the defensive problem a little bit more tractable. Go on to some points about solar wind, pulse secure and colonial pipeline. Each of these are cases where ransomware or malware launched from outside the United States was able to compromise key systems and disrupt the delivery of key services. Those intrusions have penetrated the public mind. After all, cybersecurity and cyber risks have been, in, for those in the business, have been a common concern for a decade or two. Um, most of the public, however, have considerably less than two decades worth of experience dealing with these. To many of them, it's a surprise. To many of them, they're wondering why it is that their critical infrastructure is vulnerable, who it is that is responsible for those vulnerabilities, and what it is that we can do about it. This means having a more grown-up conversation with the public, with publics, um, and with political leaders about 
where accountability lies for vulnerability exploitation. And SZA has a particular philosophy about this. Uh, we, aren't, we aren't for blaming victims. Victims are victims. The attackers, those who, order, who through unauthorized means break into systems they don't own and access data they have no right to, um, either because the data is economically valuable, because of reputation, they want to do it because that's what they do, or they're doing it on behalf of a foreign intelligence service of another country. Each category, the technique can be um, the same, but the driving trigger for the behavior can be different. Um, from the defensive side, in the private sector, their problem is that there are a lot of people interested in exploiting their vulnerabilities. From the governmental side, our problem is that we need to be able to categorize and, and um, classify um, who an attacker is, and we need to to align the appropriate um, risk mitigation response, risk management response. Um, our policy approach is about risk reduction, not risk management. We're not about preserving the ability of attackers to enter vulnerable critical infrastructure. What we want to do is improve and enhance those critical infrastructures so that they're less exploitable. Again, that means that cooperating with other countries to both access their risk experience, help them craft better defenses, but also allow them to deny access to their critical infrastructures as a jumping off point to attack other people. Each of those focuses um, are areas where CISA is active. Um, the international collaboration part of that is a new part of CISA as of last year, um, and I'll go into that next. So we collaborate regularly regularly with partner nations on topics of mutual concern, whether it's about exchanging information, uh, significant threats, or aligning policy approaches. So CISA participates in bilateral and multilateral cyber security exercises with partner nations, and be interested in exploring those opportunities with, CISA, with uh, Chile as well. Uh, we test new procedures in those exercises. We test procedures for identifying evolving threats. We test um, defensive tactics. We test hardening approaches. We test forensic, cyber forensic uh, analytic techniques um, and behavioral analysis techniques for understanding threat behavior at a distance. We found the partnerships very um, useful. Um, it allows us to share unclassified, and I emphasize, unclassified insights with the, with the private sector, which is always easier than trying to give them a, a quick reading into very sensitive information that they probably won't, won't have access to. Um, it also gives us credibility when we talk to the private sector about risk insights. After all, if we say, trust us, we can't tell you why we know something, but you have to trust us and act on, act accordingly. Uh, that's, not, that's not the way you build trust. Well, you, the way you build trust is by shared experience, Share, sharing of information, interpersonal contacts, speaking at meetings like this one. Um, so accessing those exchange venues, conferences, bilateral relationships, um, Similar concerns, similar victimization. After all, we have cyber, cyber security incidents that affect critical infrastructure, so does Chile, so do other countries. Um, both in the C5, which is sort of the US and its principal allies getting together, or in the UN or with the EU, or through NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or through other international collaborations or like-minded countries. A lot of that exchange takes place on a cert-to-cert -cert, um, level, um, on a cybersecurity department or ministry to ministry level, uh, but also in conferences like this where a responsible official um, will, to use a, to use a sort of colloquialism in, in, in English, um, put out the shingle, advertise that you're ready to, um, ready to collaborate with people, you're ready to talk to people honestly about threats and risks that are shared dilemmas, um, and hopefully uh, mutually gain and collaborate, build trust that way. So CISA Global is the name of our global strategy, um, which uh, as of last year um, was blessed by the, by the US Congress. So I guess four goals. Um, first goal is to advance operational cooperation with international partners. I sort of described that um, a little bit already. Next goal is to build international partner capacity. That's for the reason, all the reasons already stated. Um, someone who defends their own cyberspace better is less likely to be victimized by, um, by attackers from their own country and from their neighbors because they'll have better capacity. They'll also be more likely to share their own insights with neighbors. After all, collective cyber defense being a shared value. Um, also, 
allowing knowledge and techniques, cyber hygiene techniques, for example, to flow down to ordinary people and to small businesses, which are the big, the big uh, users, the biggest demand signal for cybersecurity advice uh, and assistance is small to medium-sized enterprises in the United States. I believe that may be true, true in Chile, and it certainly is in Europe. Um, that's what we mean by building partner capacity. You're building partnership capacity at the corporate level, at the governmental level, and at the local local level and ultimately the consumer level. So there's more defensive capacity to impede attackers as they seek to exploit systems to which they should not have access. And next, we want to strengthen collaboration with international partners through stakeholder engagement and outreach. That means visits, um, diplomatic exchange, and honest conversations between governments and responsible officials about the policy dilemmas they, they confront and how they can collectively or collaboratively advance uh, shared interests. And lastly, shaping the global policy ecosystem. After all, as I've observed, the ecosystem, the internet and cyberspace in general is a global policy ecosystem, not just a technical substrate that we all operate on. That means that different countries have different rules on privacy, on breach notification, on encryption, um, on, on permissible material that's allowed online, on maldis and misinformation, for example, on the ability for big social media platforms to operate across border. All of that takes place in a global policy ecosystem that's, that's structured by laws, um, governmental um, inter exchange of what principles drive those laws in search of shared values and shared perspectives uh, can create a more plastic and consumer and citizen friendly cyberspace that um, can advance economic and other values that we all share in common. On operational cooperation, and by this I mean cooperation in the context of specific incidents or events, um, we think that shared situational awareness is the best path, best path forward. We want to work with international partners to advance collective abilities to maintain continuous situational awareness of physical and cyber incidents and emergency communication issues. This work contributes to a collaborative global environment where we and partners can learn from each other's mistakes and hopefully identify emerging risks and create effective defenses in a more timely manner. And part of this, we want to identify concerns and threats that may impact critical infrastructure in particular in order to facilitate an expedited response and mitigate negative consequences without misperception. After all, critical infrastructures and their proximity to defense uh, means that national security and actions you take to protect national security can breed mistrust by neighbors. What we want to do is make sure that defensive preparations that are undertaken are understood in their proper light. Um, that means, again, deep conversation, exchange, and sharing of information. Now, that's easier with some countries than others. Um, and I won't mention which countries that I think are harder to deal with. But anyway, just a few examples of what CISA does. For example, last week, CISA partnered with the Australian Cybersecurity Center, the New York the United Kingdom's National Cybersecurity Center and the Federal Bureau of Investigation and released the Joint Cybersecurity Advisory Top Routinely Exploited Vulnerabilities List, which details the top vulnerabilities routinely exploited by malicious actors from across the world in 2020. And it also includes those being widely exploited thus far in 2021. Now, the list also includes mitigations for those exploited vulnerabilities. The vulnerabilities are serially exploited. People don't patch them enough, or systems that are configured poorly remain poorly uh, configured for an extended period of time. By publishing under the collaboratively with these partners a set of risks, mitigations, and guidance for how to take at-risk systems offline before you restore them more safely to service, we're trying to advance the collective security of all. That's just one example of the kind of uh, activity that CIS is involved in. Another example, last fall we joined efforts with the cybersecurity authorities of four other nations, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the UK, and released an advisory on technical approaches to uncovering and remediating malicious activity. Highlights technical approaches to uncovering malicious activity includes mitigation steps according to best practices. The purpose of the report is to enhance incident response among partners and network administrators, along with serving as a playbook for incident investigation. Now, each of these reports are available on CISA.gov, our, our domain. Um, there's a lot of other material there too, including self-help tools 
uh, analytical tools that allow businesses and enterprises to understand their own cybersecurity in terms of a best practice framework like the NIST cybersecurity framework. So we empower by giving tools, we share information to build shared situational awareness, and we give lists that enable trend analysis of risk uh, exploitation across the world to try and raise the defensive baseline for all countries. That's what CIS is about. We want to help build the capacity of our partners because it contributes to our own security. So it's a very self-interested um, approach to collaboration. Sure, we want everybody to have safe cyberspace, but we obviously want ourselves to have shared cyberspace. The best route to that is through dense collaboration with neighbors and friends. You know, I'm trying to beat over the head the notion of international collaboration for a reason, because we want to liaise and support international partners in developing their own capacity because their detection, their better detection is our better detection. Their better, uh, better assessment uh, capability to assess impacts and interdependency risks is our better assessment potential. In that way, um, CISA's growth over the last three years is contributing, we think, to a more um, policy relevant, more risk managed international cyberspace. The relationships that underlie that are key to, I think, the continuation of the internet and cyberspace as a as an agile, competitive, um, mostly positive environment where exchanges of information and economic activity can grow. I would say, you know, personally, that it's possible for cyberspace to be lost to a generation who don't trust it, who don't trust the information that's there, who don't want to deal with the risks of identity theft, of malware, of just exploitation of the public sphere due to criminal activity dominating the environment. That isn't the situation today, but the trends aren't that encouraging. Proactive action is necessary to preserve the openness and utility of IT as a global ecosystem, and of the internet as a specific version of that ecosystem that facilitates trade, defense, and economic growth. So that last part about a peaceful, agile, um, technologically advancing cyberspace is a real policy conundrum for us or, or a challenge for us. On the one hand, government didn't create the modern, modern internet ecosystem. It participates in it. It selectively regulates it, but it doesn't want to drive out the innovation from the private sector that makes, makes cyberspace an interesting and, and vital part of the global ecosystem. The malware and bad actors do exist. Exploitation opportunities exist. The question is, what do we do about it? Now, from our standpoint, we value the partnership with Chile in particular as an example of what we do about it. So the collaborates with the Minister of the Interior and Public Security on an ongoing basis. Proud to participate alongside the Minister of Interior and Public Security during the OAS Cybersecurity Awareness Campaign in October to demonstrate regional cooperation. And we value Chile's active participation, collaboration, information sharing through OAS CERT, CERT Americas network. Similarly, you know, we commend Chile's active participation and collaboration in the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, Security and Prosperity Steering Group. And, you know, we want to expand and deepen that um, in the development of cybersecurity exercise incident response protocol guidance for transnational cybersecurity incidents. All of those um, efforts to, to build capacity, commonality, harmonization of C certs and CERT uh, protocols uh, add to that more governed but more open cyberspace where malware and bad actor behavior sure it exists but it doesn't dominate in the way that some fear that it might dominate if we are if we don't get this right so as we look to address shared risks and common threats CETA wants to expand the collaboration with chile with the armed services and with others in the chilean government who'd be interested in working with us uh, to achieve these common goals recognize and applaud, applaud um, your country's proactive advocacy in doing your part in protecting your, po your population from COVID because we think COVID is a special case of an asymmetric uh, vector that shows certain critical infrastructures are very, very fragile and the collective action can remediate 
uh, and assist in solutions. So collaboration again, threats are, threats are, are common, remediations through shared knowledge uh, need to be generated to match those. But just to close, threats in cyberspace are not restricted by borders. Now that's centrally why CIS is interested in international collaboration, but not only. The positives of the internet are often lost in the rush to mitigate th threats and risks. After all, cyberspace wasn't created, at least mostly it wasn't created, um, so the cybersecurity professionals like us could have a good time pursuing risks that are intellectually fascinating and probably financially lucrative. It was, it was created to allow the sharing or at least exchange of information and evolved into a repository of the greatest collection of information available for exchange in the history of the human race. That's worth preserving. It's also worth preserving because it's probably the most, the most global single platform for economic exchange and advancement in history. Those are, that's what's on the line when, when we seek to address risks and risk management uh, goals in cyberspace. That's why we're so happy to collaborate with countries like Chile and others to achieve those ends. Um, and with that, happy to take questions and thank you for listening. I'm still here. Oh, oh, hi. I couldn't see you. I didn't have your um, uh, picture. Oh, thank you so much. It was very, very interesting. Um, I have two questions here. What's the best strategy for protecting the critical infrastructure of a country? Boy, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can take both questions at a time if you like, and then just answer them. Sorry. Okay. And so the other one is, do you think that the collaboration between the private um, world and the public world is fundamental? Sorry, I didn't catch all of the last one. Yeah, Why? like if, if the collaboration between the, the private sector and the public sector is fundamental for, for achieving uh, security? Okay, um, yes to the last one. I think that because the private sector controls the private sector drives technological innovation in critical infrastructures, both in the infrastructures themselves and the third party um, IT and OT technologies that are implemented inside critical infrastructures. So if we don't collaborate closely with the private sector, we won't actually understand how critical infrastructures operate. So yes, public private collaboration is fundamental to critical infrastructure, cybersecurity and defense. Um, and there's no way around that. And if one doesn't collaborate, one is accepting risk created somewhere else that one will then have to deal with ultimately anyway. So that would be the answer to the second question. First question, um, you know, different countries have adopted different strategies for critical infrastructure defense and critical infrastructure cybersecurity, two separate things. Um, for critical infrastructure cybersecurity, and I'll sort of focus on that. Um, first thing you need to do is understand what's critical. And we have a whole debate in the United States about whether all critical infrastructure are equally critical. Uh, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a sort of strangeness to that argument because in a sense you're arguing about how to argue. Um, you come up with a list of sometimes arbitrary list of critical systems that are necessary for the continuity of the economy, for the continuity of government, and for the preservation of economic advantage, however defined by a particular country. That's your list of priority areas that need to be protected. Then the question is who owns them? Now, what entities own them? So you come up with an entity list for for that, which it describes sometimes it's public agency, sometimes it's a private sector. So once you have your critical asset list and you have your entity list, the question is what are the interdependencies between asset owners and entities that create areas of opportunity for attackers? This is the way we view it. We talk about things called national critical functions. 
things like deliver electricity, deliver food and water, deliver electric power, deliver transportation services. And we look at the entity list and the, and the asset list for each of those critical functions. And we look at vulnerability and exploitation potential in each of those things. Once we've done that, that creates a list of, of priority areas to protect. And you can score those mathematically if you want. I, I am to like quantitative metrics. So we look at history, we look at the risk history of how people are victimized. We look at the vulnerabilities that aren't patched or secured. And then we come up with a prioritized schedule of how to take action, what kind of action you need to take and whose responsibility is to take it. That is the hard core of any strategy. Now there are strategies that prioritize threat actors. Um, for us, no secret, our priority threat actor that we worry about are China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. That would be different for Chile. But note how that intersects with the entity list and the asset list, because the actors are exploiting either the entities or the assets in their interconnection. So this is basically our method. Um, and those threat actors get special attention from our intelligence services, and they get special attention from our military as well, um, because we're concerned with securing critical infrastructure, which have, provide services to the government and to the military, among others. So that's basically our approach. There's longer ways of describing it, but I'm trying to summarize um, what the basics of a strategy are. And the most important part of that strategy, of course, is execution. You have got to have it a consistent implementation plan for doing something about that prioritized list of entities and assets that need remediating. Um, and it's continuous, it isn't something you do and then you come back five years later. Because there is a watch and warning part of this that is permanent. You need surveillance, you need to instrument your critical infrastructures to make sure you know who's there, how vulnerable they are, whether your protections are working. And you know, most of this approach is you know, anybody on this on this webinar who's going to be connecting this early in the morning is going to know, know the techniques I'm talking about here. But the notion of instrum instrumentation, dense instrumentation of networked assets, uh, is something that we're, we're trying to foster in the United States because a lot of our critical infrastructure still aren't instrumented properly for the purposes of cybersecurity and warning. They're instrumented for the purposes of their businesses. But getting that instrumentation adapted or getting access to threat feeds that allow situational awareness on exploitation and risk patterns is what we're trying to encourage the most. Thank you. I think that was very clear and concise. <laughs> and um, we, don't, I, we don't have any more questions from the chat. I'm going to encourage one more last time. If there's any questions, please now, <laughs> before, we, before David leaves us for this time. Uh, mm -mm -mm. No, I don't get any more questions. Yeah. Well, thank you, David, so much for your time and for your very interesting input to this conference. We're very happy to count on you today. Thank you. Well, yeah, give my best to Gabriel. Yes, I will. I will. <laughs> thank you so much. All right, so and uh, have a great day ahead. Same to you. Bye bye. Thank Good you. luck to all of you in the conference. Thank you so much. Bye bye. aquí con nosotros, son unos minutos nomás y seguimos con la conferencia.